When you walk down the halls of Leica and you enter any set of curtains, what you enter into is always going to be a complete surprise and it's going to be completely different. It is absolutely true that every new movie that we make gets that bit more ambitious. We want to make films that push this medium that we love, animation, that push it in new directions. And we're moving in directions that stop motion animation doesn't normally go in. And so every film demands something new, but everyone's up for the challenge. We've got a brain trust of brilliant creatives here. We have people who are sculpting puppets. We have people who are making sets. We have people who are animating all day long. And I think that's what's cool about this place, is it's this tactile wonderland. Do it practically in camera is something we try to do as much as possible. But at the same time, we bring cutting edge technology into the process. Whether it's science or innovation, it's worth the risk sometimes to go out on a limb. And with each successive film, we all work and grow as artists. We would really wanted to find a way to push facial animation beyond what we'd ever done before. And the subtlety and a range of emotion you get totally transformed into the story and you forget that you're watching a little 12-inch puppet. It's hands-on, it's tactile, there's a life to it that most of the animation forms don't have anymore. We're a group of really talented artists who want to do it the best that we can. You're like uh, the energy, the, the atmosphere just really crackles with that creativity. We don't have to be limited in the stories that we tell. That's what's exciting about the studio. It feels like we really are just scratching the surface of what this art form can do. And that's incredibly exciting to me. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm so happy you were able to join us today. I'm Brian Farisa, the director of the museum here, and this has been a, a long journey to get to this day and I think to this opening weekend for this exhibition. The conversation between Leica and the Portland Art Museum started in 2009, actually, when Leica featured their film Coraline for the first time, and it was at the Schnitzer Hall, and we had the opening festivities here. And I walked into the room where we had some of the, the maquettes and the puppets, and I went, oh my goodness, this is an art form that really needs to be featured here at the museum. And since then, it's been a nice uh, discussion we've had with them and a journey through time, and I think with their 10-year anniversary, anniversary recently and then the wealth of work and the, the portfolio that has been developed by this incredible team that you'll hear from has really given us a great opportunity to celebrate this art form. And I say art form because in many ways I believe Leica distinguishes its, its work through its sense of humanity, the ability to really show the imperfection, but also have storytelling that takes us on a journey that really reflects, I think, what it means to live today in the 21st century. So it's very special for us to feature this exhibition. Also, it's an opportunity for this museum, and I've said it before, to really embrace the creative energy of our community, Oregon, Portland, the region. This museum is really about celebrating who we are as Oregonians and people who live in the Northwest. And I can think of a better uh, creative force than Leica to, to emphasize that and to reveal that to the world. We have a mission of bringing the world to Oregon, but also Oregon to the world. And I think this exhibition does that in a very beautiful way. It's also a great opportunity for us to reflect on the museum's Northwest Film Center. It's an important entity that was founded in 1971. The Film Center has really galvanized the film community and also created something very, very special. Personally, I'm very grateful to Bill Foster, the director who's led that for over 
40 years. So a big thanks to Bill and the Northwest Film Center and his entire team. They worked tirelessly on behalf of this community and this institution. I also want to give a very special thanks. You saw Travis Knight. Travis, uh, obviously a leader of this, but also a number of people on his team. And there's too many to, to name, but there's a few that I interacted with specifically, and in particular, uh, the new CFO, Brad Wald. Rosemary Colliver has been a great advocate. Mark Shapiro, I think many of you know him. Dan Paschal and Martin Pelham both have given me and our, my museum great guidance. So a big thanks to them. And then Optimist was the designer of the exhibition. I think if many of you have been through it, we really took advantage of what it means to be in an art museum, celebrating this beautiful art form, the craft, and I think they delivered in a very articulate way to show the beauty of the art that we are all experiencing through these films. On my team, there's Don Urquhart, Matthew Juniper, and Michael Smith, who again partnered with what we're calling the dream team of installation conceptual ideas, because this exhibition at this scale has never been done before, so we really needed to start thinking deeply about bringing it to life, and I think they've done it beautifully. We also have a number of sponsors. You know, this museum is privately supported for the public good, and every, every dollar counts. And I owe a big thanks to Phil and Penny Knight, who are our lead sponsors. We also have a number of exhibition supporters listed on the wall, um, all very important. I think you saw some lists before, but I want to call out a few more. In particular, Helen Joe and Bill Witzel, both of those trustees of this museum, Ameriprise Financial and Columbia Threadneedle, the Clark Foundation, Kindercare, also very important, Stoll Reeves, U.S. Bank, and U.S. Bank Foundation all contributed to this exhibition in particular. A big thanks to them. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator who also served as our, my curatorial advisor for this project, and that's Rose Bond. Rose is an associate professor and lead faculty member in animated arts at the Pacific Northwest College of Art. She has been internationally recognized for her monumental content-driven animated installations, which have illuminated urban spaces in Portland, Zagreb, Toronto, Ex Exeter, UK, Utrecht, Netherlands, and New York City, among others. Rose's animation films have been presented in major international film centers, including in Annecy, Ottawa, Hiroshima, Sundance and New York, and her work is held at the MoMA Film Collection in their um, collection archives. In 2016, Rose was awarded the Oregon Media Arts Fellowship and premiered a new multi-channeled uh, projection for the Oregon Symphony in association with Messiaen's Turangalila. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, display of her craft and in remarkable artistry. I hope some of you were able to see it. She received her MFA in experimental filmmaking from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And as I mentioned, she has served beautifully as our curatorial advisor for this exhibition. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome Rose Bond to the stage. Thank you. I'm glad to see you all here. How many people here have seen the exhibition? Just raise your hand. Uh, yeah, pretty, a lot of you, okay. <laughs> um, it is my pleasure to be here uh, at this first conversation, so keep your eyes out. There's gonna be other opportunities to engage with the artists uh, of Laika as this uh, show uh, stays on at, at Portland Art Museum. But right now, I'd like to just bring up um, the animators, crafts, people, technical wonders from Laika. Yeah, welcome them. All right. So we'll start. I'm going to do, here's how it's going to go. I'm going to do a really brief introduction, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions. But really, we want to open this thing up. Um, so your questions, we know that we've probably got some ultra fans here and we have some very knowledgeable people in Portland about animation and specifically about stop motion animation. Portland is on the map. As an animator myself, I know that it, when pe most people, when I go to festivals, whatever, when they talk about stop motion, they're talking about Bristol or Portland. So. Uh, how did we get here? What's how, you know? So hopefully uh, a lot of that will be revealed. Um, the show is uh, extraordinary. 
And I feel so privileged to have been involved and to have uh, offered what I can uh, to place this work in a larger cultural and artistic uh, place. So uh, to begin with, I want to uh, introduce uh, Ollie Jones at the far end there. Ollie is the animation rigging supervisor. Uh, he's headed up the rigging on all of Leica's features. Uh, he earned his master in art degree from the famed animation department at the Royal College of Art. Yes, and um, recently, <laughs> oh, we got some RCA fans, good. Um, recently, Ollie was nominated for an Oscar in visual FX effects for his work on Kubo and the Two Strings, so welcome. Uh, Deb, Deborah Cook, costume designer. Hiya. Yeah, uh -huh, yeah, all right. You see that, right? You see that. Uh, Deb has been around since uh, Leica's beginning and has been a key player on all four feature films. She credits her fine art sculpture background at London's Central St. Martin as providing her with the opportunity to innovate in uncharted creative waters, which is, I think, where Leica finds itself most of the time. So um, really happy to have you here, Deb. Uh, Brian. Brian comes, Brian McKean comes with a background in sculpture. Uh, he's been riding, I don't know if that's the right word. Do you ride the leading edge or it's sort of like, I don't know the metaphor because it seems like he's leading the wave uh, in 3D printing or rapid prototyping. Uh, he joined Leica for Coraline and he's been <clears throat> instrumental in developing the kind of facial animation uh, and you see his work uh, and the work of others shining on that wall of faces. All right. Uh, Georgina, creative supervisor and head of puppet fabrication, has been a key player at Leica from the start. She hails from the UK. You're going to hear a lot of British accents. Remember what I said? Bristol, Portland, okay, <laughs> London. Uh, uh, she was, uh, came with a lot of experience in London from short film, uh, shorts, uh, commercials. She worked for McKinnon and Saunders, which is a kind of a premier puppet, puppet company. Um, also worked in features, including my favorite, Mars Attack and The Corpse Bride, <laughs> before coming to Portland and, and being a mainstay at Leica. And finally, Brad Schiff, Brad is the animation supervisor uh, on uh, Kubo, Box Trolls, and Paranorman. However, for those people who've been around for a while, Brad cut his teeth here on PJs and Gary and Mike. Remember that? Yeah, let's hear it. All right. <laughs> And we'll hear, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that, but he's animated on just about every Oscar-nominated uh, feature, from Corpse Bride to Coraline to Fantastic Mis Mr. Fox. And just so you know, to do the animation for Kubo, there were 70 sets. That's 70, 70 sets. How do you supervise that? Whoa. All right. <laughs> So um, let's, um, let's begin. I'm not quite sure <coughs> where to start. So I'm going to just shuffle these cards. Um, <laughs> okay, Brad. Yeah. All right. Uh, Leica has a massive warehouse. And by the way, it's so nondescript uh, that you would never, ever know uh, where it is uh, in Hillsborough. But... It does have those 70 sets uh, for Kubo. So talk to us a little bit about what does it mean to be like an animation supervisor? And maybe just sort of specifically, what are the challenges involved in that? Oh my gosh, it's, um, the building it is, it's a totally unassuming building in the middle of Hillsboro. There's no signs, no anything. It's just a big Dolph yeah, box. <laughs> And, 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 and it's massive, and the whole place is filled with, with sets, and each set is divided by big black curtains. And you know, for each one of these films, we have a team of 35 animators uh, at its peak, and we try to 
uh, uh, get animator, get, get each animator a bounce unit. So to be uh, as efficient as we can, we try to get that animator that's shooting, and when they finish that shot while they're waiting, instead of sitting around waiting to, for the set to, for the camera to be moved, for the set to be redressed, they'll jump over and they'll animate on another, on another set. And, you know, the biggest challenge, I think, always when you're animating something of this, or supervising something of this scope is, you know, you have 35 different animators, and the real trick is to try to make sure that it feels like it comes from one set of hands. And I think that that's always the, you know, the hardest, the hardest part. Yeah, great. Ollie, I'm going to jump down to you. Um, and again, these are sort of warm-up questions. So um, you're the rigor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I want to. I want to ask you. How did your background at RCA, which is kind of known as like a fine art animation yeah. program, uh -huh. how how did that play into like where you ended up and and what you do at Leica now? Well, there was at, when we was at the RCA, there was two people that were studying stop motion. One of them was myself, and the other one was Malcolm Lamont, and we both ended up at Leica. Okay. So that's there's a pretty good thoroughbred just there. Um, and what we were really trying to do, uh, he was in one room and I was in the next unit, much like the same way that um, Brad was talking about. We just had a curtain between us. And he was concentrating on character animation and I was doing more kind of special effects stuff, more kind of mechanical, making sets. And I was comping uh, characters into those sets. So there was like a definite lineage between what I was trying to do, or trying being the main word there, trying to do at college and then something that we was... Uh, eventually doing in the uh, in the studio as well. So it's, you know, animation, just so you know, uh, animation rigging is, these guys, they, very, they can stand up on their own, but they can't leap, they can't jump. We have to hold them up mechanically in space. So we build the apparatus that holds them and pushes them through space. And the animator is then using a series of winders or gears to float the anim animators around. So we're kind of like an old fashioned kind of special effects department. Yeah, old-fashioned, but also really real objects and not just digital, yeah. Yeah, real yeah. objects, <laughs> yeah. real things, real yeah. tactile. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, it's, you know, it's an engineering-based medium. Um, I'm going to move on to you, Deborah. Uh, you also um, list on your bio that you have a fine art background and graduated in sculpture. Uh, and you talk about that, like, something about that, that background prepared you. I mean, let's face it. Who gets prepared to knit a tiny sweater? <laughs> I think, um, so I went to St. Martin's and I did sculpture, but it was also in the same building where the fashion degree was happening. So um, also fine art painting and film. So all of those disciplines played into the kind of work and the access that I had to be creative. So I built a lot of installation work around abstract figurative work and costume pieces that I put myself in. So I was building environments around uh, costume work that was full scale, but also had a lot of detailed elements that involved um, other mediums, like attaching photos, using film. Um, some aspirational stop frame work that I didn't actually realize what I was doing at the time, and that's that's even existed when I was trying to create those pieces of work. So learning different um, properties of materials, like working with silicons, working with fabrics, working with upholstery even, and abstracting figurative work really helped give me the basis to learn all of those materials. It, it you know, eventually just led me here. Great. I'm going to follow up on Georgina. I'm going to call, not call you George. Uh, the um, animation, I think, if you look at the long scope of it, that there are certain eras, there are certain studios that kind of come to into their own. And I, I'm thinking, you know, back, um, back to I, the Zagreb school, or I think of George Powell and the Puppetoons, or I think of Jiri Trinka and the sort of that Eastern European kind of kind of whatever. And then of course in the UK I think of Ardman. I remember going to Annecy and seeing um, they always have like they have the films, they have the features, but they have the adverts, the advertisements. And I remember seeing like most of these what we call commercials here 
all, so many of them at that time, I think this was the 90s or whatever, were done in the UK and they were stop motion. Could you um, talk a little bit about sort of what, what grows that fertile ground? What makes a place be so uh, open and maybe how, where you see Portland in that now? It's a big question. <laughs> so. Wow, I got a big question. <laughs> you know, I think it, I was involved in a lot of those commercials in the 90s. Um, I worked for McKinnon and Saunders that was a sort of leading house in specifically puppet making for, you know, we were, we were working for many different agencies and filmmaking companies and um, short film um, sort of studios and, and kids TV. So, and I think a lot of the sort of the openness and tradition of stop motion animation in England actually comes from the children's television telling stories to kids and educating kids from an early early age. Um, BBC television was a leading force in um, telling wonderful um, preschool sort of um, ed showing sort of education through stop motion animation and telling great, great stories. So from that hub of, I mean, you know, Britain is very art based as well. There's a tradition in, in, in the British Isles that goes back for millions of years of show, you know, telling history through art, drawing, um, creating um, a sort of a learning technique through visual <laughs> communication. And I think, you know, telling stories and educating through stop motion animation is just the modern day stepping into, you know, taking that historical thread and, and telling a great story. So we, you know, that's, I think, um, we definitely excelled in Great Britain with stop motion, kids TV, commercials, and, and then a lot of feature work came our way as well because we had such a consistent flow of, of sort of... Um, actually making really high-end stop-motion films and everything that we, we were asked to sort of become a part of some of these larger projects across the world. Um, now, it's interesting because when I was at Cosgrove Hall and McKinnon and Saunders, I heard about what was going on in Portland, Oregon. I didn't even know where Portland, Oregon was at the time, but I heard that there was the same sort of traditional art form being used to sort of tell stories in experimental and literal animated ways. And, you know, it was interesting because we got to work for um, Vinton Studio way back there 20 years ago, making some head mechanics for a show that Brad probably animated <laughs> on. Um, and, you know, coming to Portland, I recognised the... Um, th Portland's very open to the arts. It's such a creative city. Oregon itself is such an inspiring, um, you know, the country here. I get inspired every day. Um, so the fact that we make beautiful visual sort of, we tell stories through a visual way does not surprise me. And it's amazing because it kind of reminds me sometimes of home in a weird way being here. Um, so yeah, I, I think both, both um, you know, England as a whole and Portland, Oregon, we, we found this visual storytelling sort of art form and we've stuck with it and we've created really thriving industries through it. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. I think it, I think it is, I mean, that, that whole idea of sticking with it. It's like you all have like worked together for a long time. And it's we like, have. there's something going right when you can keep like mm -hmm. a core of uh, creatives working together. And they seem fairly happy, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, we love no, no. each other. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> Brian, um, I wanna just, I, I, I keep hearing different numbers on this, but one of the things that I heard the other day was one million expressions. Oh and, man, it's, <laughs> it's like, okay. That's um, not of Brian, that's of the puppets, right? I have right? like yeah, four. Yeah, he has four. <laughs> um, I just want to know a little bit about, uh, and I know that you've probably said this, but probably everyone hasn't heard this, just like how do you manage that for animators? And then the other question is, how do you decide what expressions 
Ah, okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm known as the one who talks a lot, so buckle your seats. Sorry, this is going to be a long explanation. Um, so, yeah, for each one of our films, we continue to advance how many facial expressions each character can do. And you probably have heard the number. It's well in the millions for some of our lead characters. Now, we don't actually produce... Uh, millions of faces. What we do is we, we produce thousands of eyebrow shapes and we produce thousands of mouth shapes. And they're printed as two separate objects. And the animator has the ability to swap them out independently. So when you multiply the eyebrow shapes by the mouth shapes, you get, I think Kubo had something like 54 million possible facial expressions. So uh, now we didn't, again, print 54 million faces. But each face on the back has a very unique number stamped on the back. And that number tells uh, the animator uh, what expression that is and what frame that needs to go on for uh, the film. To me, it looks a little bit like alphabet soup. I don't know how the animators know exactly what they're reading, but there's uh, some indications of what that expression is. And in years past on Coraline, we were really just focused on animators being able to pick mouth shapes that made it look like she was saying a line of dialogue. So it was all about making sure that we had the correct phonemes. And the phoneme is an expression that your mouth makes uh, to say syllables and vowels, T's, V's, S's. And if you take that base, those base building blocks of phonemes, you can put them in different orders and a character can look like they're saying any line. But over the course of our movies, we've continued to try to add more and more expressivity into these emotional or into these, uh, these faces. So that's why we've ended up producing so many thousands of faces and so many millions of faces. Great, thank you. Um, Ollie, I'm gonna come back to you again in terms of the subtlety that Brian was talking about. You also work on visual effects and you just got an Oscar uh, nomination for the, the visual effects for um, Kubo, actually, yeah. Uh, so. Talk to me a little bit. I was watching Paranorman again last night, and I rem I saw some of the special effects, and to me, it looked like they were like drawn, or something. It was it, it had a different quality. Can you talk a little bit about what makes um, visual effects different at Leica from what we usually see from Hollywood? So yeah, so the we have a really great visual effects team. So there are there's a lot of digital work that goes into our movies. Some of them. Some of it is expanding the horizon, making our worlds bigger. Some of it is digital uh, extension of characters. We have background characters that are digital. And then some of them are things like, you know, our explosions, our smoke effects, some of our water. That's digital too. But instead of taking reality as the touchstone, uh, the digital team takes what we produce in the studio as the starting point for all their work. So what we do is create... Uh, kind of mechanisms and prototypes and dioramas that the digital team, digital team can then use as either influence or straight copy and turn into a digital version to work across the movie. So for things like in Kubo, for the waves, we produced like five or six different uh, working prototypes of paper that looked like waves or we produced a... Uh, kind of like a spidery kind of mechanism that pushed an undulated uh, black saran wrap and things like that. So we're always trying to go back to the tactile. It always, always comes back to the stop motion, even when it ends up being a digital asset in the end. Okay. Yeah. May, may I? Look, yeah, one, one of the cool things to the, with Paranorman was Ali, but so the cloud, you know, the, the clouds were all, you know, ultimately digital, but they started off practically. So one of the one of the elements that, that kind of runs through the film is bridal veil, sort of tool material. And Ollie had made this big wheel uh, of clouds that mm -hmm. we animated on set to see what kind of, you know, if we could do the clouds practically. And they were great. And you got, they, with the light going through them, we could see what they looked like practically. And they looked beautiful. But the problem was as we animated them, they sort of, they popped around a little bit. So we were able to give that to the visual effects department across the street. And they were able to copy that tool looking material, but they were able to get all the vaporous qualities of clouds that we couldn't get on stage. So it had the feeling of that tactility, you know, of, the, of stop motion, but being and, done in the computer. Yeah. And something that as well with Aggie, that was a lot, there was a lot of drawn version for the, uh, for the electricity that was in the hair and stuff like that, that eventually becomes CG and Brian, maybe you could talk a little bit like Aggie, how she was a kind of a hybrid character in a sense, and that was her first. 
Yeah, uh, Aggie was a unique character because a lot of her kinetic energy around her was all being done based off of blown ink drawings. So it did have a very 2D feel, but that was put on with the visual effects department. But her faces, as you guys, for those of you who've gone around the uh, exhibit, you'll see there's a sampling of her faces that were 3D printed, and we printed all the faces for that particular, for those sequences, and we would project light through the back. And this was the first time we were actually not only animating the outside of the face, and now as she's screaming and changing, changing facial expressions, we were also animating the thickness of that material. So as the light was projecting through it, you got this great sense of kinetic energy and power. Wow, it's really great for you guys to just chime in on this, okay? Because it really, it really shows, you know, it's like it's not just one department that you all are talking to each other and sharing, like, the innovation and sparking off each other. Um, no, I, yeah. I was just about to say, yeah, the whole, the whole sense of puppetry, you know, George actually makes the puppets, but there's, you know, there's Brad that's team that's animating the puppets and we're rigging the puppet so and so it's like this whole thing and it's a real dialogue yeah we couldn't we couldn't do it without anybody else around us yeah, basically <laughs> yeah yeah but that gets back to that like I feel like there's this core of people that um that are working um it's a couple of ways to go here but um I want to Deb I want to get you back in on it um in Kubo there um you do research on all of your, all the films on costuming and mm -hmm. whatnot, but I think the Kubo yeah. took you especially into Japanese culture. Um, there's a term that uh, wabi sabi, is that how you say it? Uh, anyway, it's we like to comment it's, on the it's a, okay. It's in the <laughs> PR materials, but they're talking yes. about yes. this beauty in imperfection. So, yes. what I want to just ask you to talk about just a little bit is. You're making, and have you guys seen this? Have you seen the panels where you see like the fabrics? Um, it's like what Brian was saying. You can't just go to the store and buy a pair of denim jeans and cut it up because the scale is going to expose that and it's going to look like a big burlap bag mm -hmm. that yeah. they use silk. So figuring out what these materials are, but the other thing is that they look so exquisite and yet it's gotta be so durable. It's like months on a set with hands all over it. So yeah. how, do you, how do you get to that? You know, it's sort of like perfect but really imperfect. I guess um, there is a lot of research, um, not just about the history of the culture um, especially in Kubo, but a, a lot of research goes into the kind of fabrics that we can use. Um, as you were saying, um, some off-the-shelf fabrics are bought in our first two films for Coraline and Paranorm, and we did use those more, and they were just customised. But as we've moved forward with Box Trolls and Kubo, um, we've, we've got more into engineering our own fabrics that are specifically for our use. So the properties that we need, that we could hunt forever, in, a, in an off-the-shelf fabric that we would never find. We are now trying to build those for ourselves with um, new techniques and engineering. Some of the things that are used uh, across the board in other departments, but also unique ones just to costume. So they're invested with that movability um, and property that we need just for, just for animation. So we've moved forward from using uh, realistic fabrics to, for example, an egg, uh, egg sweater. Um, it used the line work of the, the movie's artwork to um, look like a knitted sweater. So that was actually achieved by using different weight threads, dyed different shades of green on a very stretchy backing. Um, and we might look at maybe 20 or 30 different backings to find the right property. And then uh, creating the line work from the thread and the stitching. Um, so it looks like a sweater. And if you see it in the exhibition, it, it looks like a sweater. But in comparison to the one for Coraline, it's a very, very different beast. And that's the involvement that we, we've taken, the, the line we've been able to take with the success of the films is really given us a platform to be able to work more specifically for, for animation. I think what's always really difficult for um, what Deborah's team has got to do. They've got to kind of, they've got to attain what is an, a, a, 
you know, a look and a style, but they've also got to get it to perform and it's got to yeah. be animatable. And there's like with uh, Kubo sleeves, I remember Brad, you having a pretty good story about how, how difficult that was <laughs> to achieve yeah. and, and what you had to do to get there. Yeah, I remember I, I had a lot of sleepless nights about that kimono before, before we... Uh, <laughs> Before we hit stage, you know, we had numerous versions, and Deb and Debs and, and, and her team were creating versions of the costume, and, and they were beautiful, and they moved elegantly. But there, there were there were some things with it. Uh, the sleeves were wired, and you know, with a team of thirty-five animators, ultimately, uh, it needed to do the same thing. And when when Kubo put his arms by his side, there was wire around the cuff, and you'd have to sculpt it, you'd have to bend the sleeves to do a, a particular shape, and the odds of all 35 doing the same thing, it wasn't great. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so I, I went to Debs and, and, and we started a dialogue and we started talking and I thought, you know, it would be great if, if every time he put his arms down, it did the same thing. Mm -hmm. And Debs had a terrific idea, you know, origami is a theme throughout the film, and, and she thought, what if we took more of an origami approach to the costume? and created this prototype which changed everything and it was it was exactly what we wound up doing and it was amazing yeah. it's a perfect form follows function kind of thing yeah it, it took a lot of engineering to get there didn't it? i don't can't yeah. tell you how many versions we did piles and piles of them but um it, it got there in the end and the, the things that you end up using are actually quite simple they're all familiar materials it's just again it's knowing the properties and the combinations of them so we went through many, many different iterations, and the one that ended up being the most elegant actually had the most simple solution. But it's just, it's just getting there. And and uh, again, for the for the amount of duplication that we need to do, if we need to do 30 or 35 costumes. Finding a way of doing that, we you know you do a, an awful lot of research and a lot of playing around. But it's the edit at the end that really counts. That makes it that elegant and that simple looking. It's interesting as well, because while this is going on, this narrative is going on around, there's, we're trying to build the puppet. That's what I was going <laughs> to where, where are you? I mean, Well, exactly. No, we're, we're, as the puppet building team, we're making the, you know, the skeleton, the body that goes inside the costume. And you can't have a costume on a puppet that's not connected. So all of these decisions are affecting... Um, the build of the internal skeleton, which we call an armature. So the armature, you know, essentially you almost need the costume sort of as a finished piece to inform you as to how you're going to build the armature. But that's not the way it works. You've got to be. Yeah. So we're doing a lot of tests and basically what Debs and Brad are doing are informing us what we have to add on to the armature because these things have to be controllable. Yeah, and, <laughs> and a perfect example of that with, with Kubo because, you know, there's a reason you've never seen baggy clothes in a stop motion film before because it's a nightmare and, <laughs> and along with hair and oh fur my gosh and a few other things. so with with kubo he had these baggy sleeves and when they when his arms went to his side or when they stuck out the top of the sleeve just stuck up off the top of his arm and it didn't give it real world weight so we got together with george and ultimately what they wound up doing was putting an extra joint on, that was attached to essentially the tricep of the character. And so it came off the character's arm, off Kubo's arm, traveled down the sleeve and connected to the front of the sleeve. So you could pull it down and give it real world weight, make it feel like real world weight when his arm was to his side or sticking out in front and of it, him. You know, it's funny. He says a little join and some wire. We actually, <laughs> I wish it was that simple. Super and easy. <laughs> We ended up. Um, have you have you guys seen those those angle poise lamps? That's actually a sort of a bendy. Um, it's called gooseneck because um, it looks like a goose's neck, but or like maybe, a microphone stand. Yeah, yeah like your exactly. IKEA lamp or something. Yeah. Like that. So we realised that the animators need more control than just a wire, and a wire is going to break. So we actually find found miniaturised gooseneck, which we then attach to the joint so that it could have more control for Brad's team and all always stay in the position the animator put it rather than springing back up. <laughs> it's interesting to sit back and look at all of the technology that we've used over the course of our movies. And we sit here oftentimes and talk about, oh, we came up with this great technical solution or that great technical solution. But so much of those technical solutions are absolutely driven by the creative needs for the film. 
And it's fun to sort of go look back and say, oh, why did we choose that technology? Because this, we needed to figure out a way to make the character perform like this. Or we needed to figure out a way to make the character look like this. And that's the fun thing about Leica is each one of our characters is unique. Each one of our characters has probably at least a dozen little uh, inventions that we've had to figure out along the way, some even more than that to make them work. Um, so that's, that's the fun thing. I think we, we do talk about technology that we use, but it so much is driven by the creative. Yeah. I want to I'll, I'll aim this at, at you too here, but anybody else can jump in. Um, let's talk a little bit about aesthetic choices. You're talking about the film is calling for, I guess there's another way of saying that, is possibly an aesthetic choice. I'm thinking um, of the 3D printing, and I'm thinking of um, puppets, Georgina, puppets are by in sort of inherently stiff. And you guys have this squash and stretch quality uh, that, that comes out. But I want to talk about the facial uh, expressions and, and, uh, and the 3D rapid prototyping. Um, the, there are choices that are made there. I think when you think back of Jiri Trinka and the hand, that puppet face has hardly any not a lot of, of, of expressions. Um, Anna Melissa, uh, which was recently out, made a decision, they're using uh, a replacement, um, uh, replacement parts, but they kept the seam. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you guys went through to come to these uh, aesthetic choices? Sure, so we, uh Back on Coraline over 11 years ago, we made a decision to try and take this 100-year-old technique of replacement animation and try to fuse it with 21st century 3D printing technology. And at the time, we were the first studio to ever do this. And the idea was simple. We were gonna take something that used to be hand sculpted. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have seen the film Nightmare Before Christmas, but Jack Skellington is a perfect example of a replacement animated character where he had 800 hand sculpted faces that were reused over and over again for that film. For, for our film Coraline, we knew that we wanted Coraline to have a, a huge emotional range. We needed her to be able to be very subtle and tender in certain moments and really scared at others. So replacement animation gives you the best of both worlds. And we didn't know how we were gonna hire a team of so many sculptors to do this, which is why we came up with this idea of 3D printing. So by 3D printing, we were able to harness the power and the subtlety of a computer because basically we're, we're animating in the computer, just the faces, and then we're sending the, that facial geometry to a 3D printer that produces them as a physical object. So Leica's desire is to constantly try to find ways that we can make our characters perform in ways that stop motion has never been able to achieve before. And that's from the rigging, to the costumes, to the armature, to the way the animators breathe life into them. So everything about our style is to try to come up with really naturalistic styles that are redefining what people think of as stop motion. And that is more, more uh, that's very true in the faces. There's definitely a lot, of, a lot of emphasis on performance. There's a lot of emphasis on acting. So we will present different facial performances to the director. In CG, they're just seeing a little floating head talk. And they'll go back and give very specific notes on we want that character to know. We, a few frames earlier, we want him to, to sneer or we want him to get really sad and start to feel like he's going to well up. And for the first time in stop motion, we have the ability to go back in and, and bake those performances into the 3D printed parts. But to, to answer your question about the line, this is a funny story. Uh, on Coraline, uh, I told you guys I talked a lot. On Coraline, there was a, we had bisected the face in the top and the bottom. And Henry Selleck, who was the director of Coraline, wasn't sure if he wanted to delete that line, if he wanted to have that seam line uh, erased. So he put out a, a, uh, a vote to the crew and asked them to vote on whether or not we should remove the line. And he got all these responses back. And one of the best responses was, I think we should leave the line because the name of the movie is Coraline, after all. <laughs> we did decide to erase the line. <laughs> Normally, one of these guys does a little drum roll at that, but they were out of sync this time. We've heard it too many yeah. times, Brian. <laughs> Some of these guys have already heard me say that once today. What I find amazing about what Brian's team is doing is that you were saying riding on the wave or something of uh, rapid prototyping, but really they're trailblazing because they're always trying to do something that the technology isn't quite up to speed with. And so you take something like Coraline where you used to 
you're painting every face independently and then putting a freckle on yeah. and things like that. And I just think maybe you talk about like how the process of and the uh, technology is caught up with our desires. Yeah, so on Coraline, we had to hand paint every single freckle, every single lip, every single eyebrow. It was lo really laborious, so we had really broken through with this amazing performance potential, but we were constantly needing to go back to the director and, and negotiate with them of how much detail they could put into the, the paint on a character's face. So starting on Paranorman, we decided that we were going to take this really successful process and this successful technology and basically throw it out the window and put all of our eggs in this basket of new color 3D printing. And there was only one color 3D printer on the market. So we were literally were hedging our bets on uh, an untested technology. And to, to Ollie's point, this, these 3D printers were designed to make prototypes. They were designed to produce something that looked somewhat decent, that ultimately that part was going to end up being produced out of plastic or out of rubber and manufactured somewhere else in the world. So they were really just there as a prototyping machine. But what we were trying to do is we were trying to make them our final product. So we were demanding that these machines found these crazy colors that the manufacturer said wasn't possible for them. This is outside the printer's gamut. And it was, I think it was a lot of being naive, a lot of us just trying to, trying to hammer these machines to do things that they didn't think possible that allowed us to suddenly stumble across some, some things. And looking back on it, uh, if we had approached it differently, if we had approached it more scientifically, we would have gotten bogged down in the weeds. But because we were going very specifically for this creative look, we just continued to, if we wanted that particular red, we just started throwing all these different colors at the machine. And finally, we got a red. And it actually was orange on the computer screen, but it prints red, so great, we'll, we'll go that way. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I think we all applaud Brian as well, because like on Paranorman, when we did the shift from the resin printer to the color powder printer, it did not work. Like it was not, no. those faces were not working. And I'm sure there were a lot of stress, the sleepless nights for Brian as we got, and I remember that first test, the first Neil test that we did. You know, and it was cool, because Coraline had, you know, six freckles on each side that could all be hand painted. And then you had Neil that had hundreds of freckles on each side of his face. But I remember that first test that worked and it was, it was a it cell. It, it, was it a, looked terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, no, the first one that worked <laughs> it was, but, it was you know, great. That's the thing about Leica is that we are given so much uh, freedom to try and fail. And we've all talked about, you know, Deb's 30 different fabrics mm -hmm. or 30 different costume or layer, liners. 29 of them had to fail before we found the one that works. And I think that back on so many of these things, if we had the producer or the directors banging on our office doors saying, how's it going, how's it going, is it fixed yet, or is it figured out yet, we would not be nearly as successful. They, they give us the opportunity, they let us work together, and they sit back and I think they're probably having sleepless nights yeah, hoping that we're going to figure it out. Yeah. This is great. This is my last question. I want to end up with, with you, Brad, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Based on what you were saying, and thank you, Ollie, for opening that up, and thank you, Brian, it's, it's this thing that you're given this opportunity here, but uh, being around Portland for a long time, I think there's a feeling in town among the animators that you could do whatever, you could take a lot of risks, um, and you could take a form of animation maybe that hadn't really been used uh, in a sort of professional or high caliber way and try to try to bring that. You've been in Portland for a while. Um, what makes, I mean, partly it's, it's like itself. Is there anything though from the, the city, the community, the place that it is that also um, supports that idea of, and makes it different than Hollywood, I guess? You know, I mean, I mean, what we do is very special that, that I mean, Portland itself is a very artistic city. It has a great art community here, and I think there's and there's a demeanor to the city, which is is um, I don't want to say laid back, but it but it allows artists to be artists without the without that aggressive competitive edge that Los Angeles or Hollywood has, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And I think that that you know I, I moved here in '98 to work on uh, to work at Wolverton Studios to work on the PJs. And even back then, you just, there, there was a, there's almost like a, a, a support from the city, like a, a confidence that you get just from being here, uh, a, 
just an inherent comfortableness of, of, of being able to take chances, of being able to do things different. And, and it's been that way from when it was, you know, from when, when it was Wolvent Studios to when it was, you know, to now at Leica. And it's, um, it's nice. And we, and we can do things without the pressure of, uh, of Hollywood, without the pressure of, you know, aggressive, you got to get it done, you got to get it done. And it's, I don't know, it's special. It's hard to, to put it, you know, to verbalize it into words. And it, yet you're getting the Oscar yeah. nominations right up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. The, the word Leica is Russian for little barker or noise from an unexpected place. So even that idea of us being up in Portland, Oregon and making an impact, uh, at least I think that's true. Somebody can verify that. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good I've story. I like years. that one. I think independence is like the, a really strong part of what we do. Independence as a studio or independent as like in terms of making stop motion is on the outside of and looking in and also just being in Portland as well. Just, you know, there's, you know, people riding around on six foot, you know, unicycles. There's a lot of independence here as well. So I think there's, there's a lot of synergy with the yeah. studio Sculptural and the city. Sculptural bikes, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's open it up. Thank you, guys. Hearing you say Corpse Bride, I remember watching that and just being blown away by the cape and like learning about it. It's like, your industry has heart, and there's not a lot of heart in other places that I see. And you can feel the love resonating off these characters that you guys are producing. And I just want you to know that I feel it. It's like Jim Henson, but way more like in tuned. And I just want you guys to know it really touches my heart a lot and it brings my inner child a lot of happiness. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank yeah. you. And a little question. The faces on the sisters, why do they carry masks? And why do they have masks on their faces? I mean, their, their faces are beautiful when they take them off. There's like some scars, but maybe there was something I missed when I watched that movie, but I was just thinking. Yeah, I don't think you ever see their full faces. I think the, the, the masks were giving it a very spooky element. And they were there in the early character design. Uh, and I was very excited because, great, we don't need to make faces for that character. You never see any facial <laughs> animation. My painters were very excited because they painted those masks. <laughs> and it was yeah. actually based on a traditional um, art form, Japanese art form, which, Debs, like you there, might want to talk. No, no theater masks. Um, ancient Japanese, no theater and it, they're very haunting and very ghost-like, and that's why they were selected for those characters. And the fact that their mouths don't move, but the voices come out is very, very eerie and quite unusual for stop frame as well, after the efforts Bryant goes to make for yeah. I've been pitching faces. a character that talks and the mouth doesn't move for <laughs> films now. <laughs> I know, we were so excited about it. It goes against everything we, we do, typically. <laughs> it's interesting. Sorry, Brian. They're my favorite puppets ever made. <laughs> and their faces don't... But the power that emits from those characters, those two sisters, when I see them on the screen, I'm hiding behind my sofa. You know, they are such... They're so intimidating, because we just... We're so used to a human face moving and visualizing, you know, communicating even through your eyes. And these things just nothing. <laughs> uh, thank you all so much for what you do. These are instant classics. They are in our home. I know they are for, for so many. Um, I've always wondered, has this ever happened? You get to the end of creating, making a movie. You all sit down, you all watch it, and somebody goes, I really want to reshoot that one scene because <laughs> the sleeve or the face or like if we shot it from this side, wouldn't it be great? And if that happens, do you all say, I'm really sorry, I'm done with our contract? Or do you actually have to reset things up? I, I mean, I think it's when we're done with each project, we have an opportunity. So, you know, the, the, the shooting schedule is over. We'll go through like I know I'll go through and, you know, we always try to do a certain amount of reshoots. You know, typically for me, I'll look through things that are performance based, things that sort of remind me, that take me out of the movie because it reminds me that I'm watching a puppet and it, and it pulls me out of the story. Uh, the director will look at it from a different reason. The producer will look at it from a different reason and they compare those notes. Ultimately, it's the director's call which, which, one, which shots we reshoot, but there's always a, a, a chunk of eight to 20 reshoots that we wind up doing. But once those are done, I think we all feel very good with, with the final product. And then try to grow on the next one, you know, style-wise. And the way that it's set up at our studio um, is there's 
before you get to shoot a shot, there's um, a block through of that shot. There's a rehearsal of that shot. So it's all about trying to get everything in place and make those decisions or changes of mind before you actually get to shooting the shot for real. So because it's a very time consuming, you know, process to have to reshoot, reshoot. So yeah, I, 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 go ahead, Ollie. I was right. just gonna say I think the you know it's it's a time based medium and there is a kind of theater theatre to it and the you know the animators are our actors and I think that's where a lot of the love comes from is that we don't massage the love out of it. We don't mm -hmm you know, identify every pixel that's wrong with it. We let the kind of the beauty it's of the... It's definitely embracing yeah, the imperfections. Imperfections and, stand. You know, yeah. 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 I, I see some costume elements sometimes. And I just think, God. Yeah, we all, we all have that, but, you know, it's, it, it's oh, in service of the... Them. Yeah. yeah there, there are always things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like doing Lego stop motion animation. Because it's really easy to do, and there's all the facial expressions already laid out. And me and my brother like doing Lego animation. And we were, and he's not here right now because he's sick. But <laughs> I was just wondering, would you recommend clay animation over Lego animation, or oh. and or which one do you think is easier? You can do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy. It's not. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm not an animator, but I grew up absolutely in love with claymation. That was what got me into this business and also taught me that I'm not an animator. I don't have the patience to do it. Um, so that's why I like replacement animation because it, you can just take something that's already animated and stick it on and it looks great. So I'll kick that over to Brad because you've done both. Yeah, I've done both. I, I, you know, I did clay animations in, in, as a kid and in school. and. Um, didn't even think to do, but we didn't have the little Lego guys when I was, when I was a kid. <laughs> old. In the old days. Well, we didn't have the little <laughs> no, Lego we guys. We had Lego, we had the blocks, but we didn't have the guys. Um, and, and it depends what you want to do. I think the Legos are awesome. And I think, you know, if you want to do something with a clay character, if you want to get it, try to, try to manipulate a character to look like it's talking or turning from a, you know, a person into a monster or it's you know clay is a fun thing to to toy around with and i encourage you to do both of them yeah, yeah that's mix what i it was up. gonna say <laughs> do it both in shop <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the beauty of it you know that's what how we think about things we yeah. don't we're not kind of limited by either or we we mm -hmm. have to take every kind of little moment yeah. and we mix it all up and, and that's put how in. you make something new yeah it's innovation and a little trick of the trade, if, if you're doing some clay animation, don't be afraid to put a little wire skeleton inside it to hold the clay up, because the clay might start to sag of its own accord, and all the animators put little armatures inside their clay. So, top tip. <laughs> Thanks for being here and offering so much awesome wisdom and knowledge. It's really cool kind of seeing you guys have this synergy um, as you're discussing. It's just amazing. And... Even though you talk a lot, I really like it, so just, just remember. But, uh, I think that question, was directed at me. But <laughs> <laughs> um, my question's uh, mainly for Georgina, uh, but it's just kind of like what creative supervisor means to you, kind of what that entails, and uh, I guess the second part just being how do you determine how to divide your attention between departments and your team and keep that collaboration and communication going? That's a really good question because I'm glad that we're bringing up the crew around us because, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of, what, one, two, three, four, five. We're, we're key people at Leica, but it's the crew that make the work that, you know, you see out there. And I have an amazing team that grew from initially 25 people when I first started on Coraline to 85 at the you know, in, on our latest movie. Um, and my job, I see my job as being the conduit of information. You know, I, I get the ear of the director, the head of animation. I, you know, every day can deal with the people you're seeing up on stage here making sure that I can try and get as much information to the team so that they can do the best job possible. You know, as, as a creative supervisor, I hardly get to make anymore, which it saddens me because I made puppets for 20 years, but that knowledge of making puppets for 20 years is, is what allowed me to basically facilitate my crew with 
the tools, the information that they need to do their job. Um, and, you know, they're, they're superstars, they're, they're artists, though, and they are in their comfort zone when they're doing their one little thing at their desk, and at times they forget that they've got to talk to the person next to them or pass the puppet off to the next department. So, you know, that's, it's my job to make sure that they're thinking ahead and they've got the information for the moment in hand. Um, yeah, so... And I'm sure everybody else... Yeah, the rapid prototyping team's about 65 to 70 people, so it's huge, and it's grown from, I think, uh, around 20, 25 on Coraline. I think there was about five costume makers on Coraline. Now there's around 18 yeah. fabricators, but we also have a massive support team of coordinators around us as well that create all of that interaction and organize us every day to impart everything we know yeah. and help things help things run smoothly. Um, and we have about 10 riggers that are servicing kind of, on average, like three animators each. So they're part of a, the on-stage team. So they're working with the cameramen, the set dressers, the animators, and the, all the, uh, the stage crew, like uh, ADs and stuff like that. So that's a whole big uh, kind of ensemble. Hello. Hi. So Hello. Hi. <laughs> What was the hardest like scene to do in Kobo? Oh, starting here. <laughs> Giant skeleton. Yeah. The monkey. Moon beast. <laughs> yeah, the fight on the boat. You know, they were they were they were all hard on Kubo. And I hate to, you know, I, I hate to say that they but they were. Like any one of these of these things on <laughs> on Kubo and another film would have been, you know, the thing on that movie to be the hardest thing. And we had Six of them. The, the thing that was Ten. really interesting about walking around this exhibit is seeing the Coraline Garden for the first time in almost a decade and seeing how beautiful that set was, and, but how scary that set was to build. That was the thing that I think concerned so many people on Kubo is, or Coraline is how are we going to build this magic garden? And we, I feel like every single one of our films has three dozen of those. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the skeleton... It's the skeleton that's in the exhibit is the skeleton that was in the film. And so we had one animator that was on, you know, it was mostly broken in half. So it was, so it was cut at the waist. So you'd see the rib cage, it'd have the arms and the head. And it was on a hexapod, which is kind of, um, it, it's what you would see on a flight simulator or an amusement park ride. So you could control the twist, the tilt back and forth, the side to side with this jog box, like this these dials that were, were made up. And then an animator is up there on the scaffolding, moving these arms, giant, you know, with his, ha you know, with his hand. It was nuts. And, and <laughs> you know, like normally, normally we're moving things that are, you know, a fraction of a millimeter, and Charles is up there trying to animate this skeleton. And, you know, sometimes his movements are this big. He's like, it just doesn't seem right to move it that, <laughs> that far. But really, in scale, it was only about this big. It's funny because... Uh, in that scene, the skeleton was consistently holding the monkey, which was our biggest challenge because animators, to start with, when you say a fully furry animal and you're going to animate it, they run out the door. They're like, no, we are not animating fur. So we'd spent all this time overcoming how we were going to make an animatable furry monkey. And then you don't even notice the monkey in the big, huge skeleton's hand. And I don't think Charles even once worried about the fur on the monkey. It was like, oh my God, how am I going to want to make this skeleton? What would be your future dream animation project? Oh, future dream Ooh. Ooh. Wow. Remember, non-disclosure. <laughs> Wow, you've stood us all to silence. I know, we, we haven't gone into space yet. I would say something you know, with one room so and no dialogue for me. That would be <laughs> no dialogue. <laughs> Definitely the one room and the one character. <laughs> Hi. It's Hi. very great for you guys to be here. I'm really thankful. You guys are, I mean... It, I don't want to exaggerate when I say you guys are pretty much a perfect animation studio. You guys have top technology, top artists. Uh, I believe you guys contribute to what I believe we're still in the animation renaissance. Um, I have a two-part question. One, how do you decide on choosing a story and saying this is a story that deserves to be told in this animation style and can't be told in other animation styles or in our style? 
And uh, my second part is that, um, well, I'm an animator myself. I'm a stop motion animator. I work with clay. What are the really hard parts I'll have to go through? What are stuff, what are the scariest parts of going through it? And how do I go through that? Like whether it's financial things or people, like major audiences not understanding your work. I mean, do you want to, the first one is, it's really story based. Yeah, it's, all, it's always story based. And I don't think we kind of, we, there's obviously, there's a, there's, there's an aesthetic that we, we're drawn to. But we don't shy away from what should be a stop motion movie. I mean, remember just like when Henry Selick first started talking about this with us, he would always be like, if it's done like this, we want stop motion. We want it to do that. So we would never shy away from a challenge. We never say, well, that's not really something that we should be doing. Um, and then do you want to take the second half? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, doing clay, you know, doing clay animations, doing films, any films for that matter, I think that you're putting yourself out there in a vulnerable place. So you start to do something that you believe in, that you think is cool, that you think is funny, that you think is scary, whatever it happens to be. And it's such a long process. And I can just tell you from, from my experience in film school and whatnot, you know, I would start these projects that I thought were, were cool, that I was really into. And it takes so long to do them that about halfway through, you lose all objectivity and you're not, you don't think it's, is this really funny? Is this really something that people are gonna like? I'm never gonna get this done. I remember going through a thing and I remember calling my mom my second year in grad school, and crying, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna get this thing done. She goes, you, you always do that. You always get through this phase <laughs> and you always get it done. But, but I think, you know, I, it's, it's all very hard and it's all, uh, it's, it's a risk that I think that we've all taken yeah. mm -hmm. that I think is important in growing as an artist and becoming who you want to be as an artist. And really, I would say, you know, it, stop motion animation isn't easy in any, I think in any of our um, specialized areas, but that is the joy of it as well, because when you overcome a sort of a problem day in, day out, but when you see something come to life on the screen and tell a beautiful story, it's worthwhile. But yeah, it isn't easy every day. <laughs> and you hit a wall and you climb over that wall and you hit another one. Hi. Um, so at what point in like either any of your or individual or sort of like mutual career at Leica, do you look at a project and you not go, oh dear God, what have I done? I'm so in over my head, and, and I'm never gonna finish it. Like, are you there yet, or is it like? We're always there. I think we're, we're always there right there. now. <laughs> <laughs> There's been four days when I haven't been there. I think it's been the release of each one of our films. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's sort of. I think those two um, questions are connected in a way. There's a lot of sleepless nights, but there's a lot of energy to get up in the morning and go to work and try to solve the problem. It's a good balance of yeah. sheer terror and sheer excitement. <laughs> All right, I think we'll wrap it up on that note. Uh, let's give a big round of applause and thanks.